Amen. How's everybody doing today? Come on. Are you happy to be in church today? I know there's a few of us in the room and those are online. Can we just get excited and thankful that we are alive today? Man, God is so good. I'm just so thankful that we get to worship and sing and that we get to just hear from his word. And um, I'm so honored to be here today and and so honored to share God's word with you. And and for those of you who don't know me, I am the only black person on staff here at King's Church. I made African-American history, y'all. Mom, you'd be proud of me. Uh, And I have a wife. We have five children. And uh, I am so, of course, honored to be here and to share on Thanksgiving weekend, y'all. Yeah, we have lots to be thankful for and God is so good, man. I mean, of course, even in like a middle of a pandemic, he is still faithful and still so good. We're in a series called Beholding Jesus. Say Beholding Jesus. And we've been in a series trying to turn down the noise and trying to fixate our focus on Jesus. And here's why, is when we behold Jesus, When we start to see him more completely, we will start to love him more fully. And that's our heart for this series is that we kind of pause on on the minutia stuff and that we kind of go back to what's true and, and what's solid and what's sure. And that is Jesus. And so over the last few weeks, we've been just discussing about his character and his attributes and his personality because there is something for us in who he is. (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be a long morning. You better talk back to me. There's something for us in him, and that's why we've been on a journey beholding who Jesus is. And so if you have your Bible, won't you turn with me to Mark chapter 4? We're going to be in the gospel of Mark chapter 4. Are you well? Yes. Are you good? Yes. All right. If not, I'll just preach to myself. It's all right. Mark chapter four, verse 35, it says this. That day when evening came, he being Jesus, he said to his disciples, 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 let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind them, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there was also other boats with him. And a furious squall, say squall, came up and the waves broke over the boat so that that it was nearly swamped. But Jesus was in the stern sleeping. (laughs) I love the details of scripture. That he was sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? What's wrong with you? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. The wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said, he said, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? For the next 35 minutes, I want to preach today on Jesus, our peace. Jesus, the missing peace. Would you pray for me? God, we love you today. God, we thank you for who you are today. God, we ask, God, that there would be a deep revelation and sense of the peace of God. God, it is needed today that we need peace And so, God, I ask, God, that would we behold your glory and behold who you are in fullness and in glory. May we leave this place changed and challenged and transformed. And, God, would you speak through me. May the words of my mouth be acceptable and pleasing to you today. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. Amen. Won't you look to the person on your right, of course, in your bubble, and tell them you look good today. Thank you. Thank you. I do. I do. Thank you. Have you ever been in an experience um, with some friends or your spouse, and you leave that experience with just two 
different responses. We've all have it. Now, before, of course, I got married, I had some friends plan a uh, bachelor party for me. Yeah, buddy, we turn up, okay? Now, they're all pastors, so, you know, <laughs> we weren't wild or nothing, right? Now, these friends of mine were of the white descent of mine, okay? So they're not, they're not you know, my kind of community, but they were good friends of mine, and they said, you know what, let's plan a bachelor's party for Bradford right before he marries his bride. And so I'm pumped. I'm excited. I thought we're going to go downtown St. John somewhere or live it up, go eat some food and enjoy ourselves. You know, just do some city stuff. Now, if you know me, I am what's called a, a urban cow. Okay. I am from the urban jungle. I am someone who loves malls and hotels and, and waffles. And, you know, I love the city. Now we started our excursion, and, 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 they just, and they started to drive me towards Moncton. Of course, it was a surprise, and of course, I had no idea what was happening. We drive to Moncton, and then we start to go a little bit in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, where in the devil are these white friends of mine taking me? <laughs> and so we drive into the woods, and then I see a sign that says, tree go. What? is that? So I walk into Trigo and they're all pumped and they're all stoked and they're getting their harnesses on and, and this harness feels a little bit too tight on me. Like, what? And so we are in Trigo and of course you know, if, if you don't know what that is, Trigo is uh, like, a, like a climbing kind of park. You, you do uh, ropes and you do zip lines and all this type of stuff. And so I... First, I was like, okay, this is not happening. I am not for sure this big boy going to go on a tree. They're like, oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. Bradford, enjoy your life. And literally for the next two and a half hours, I'm struggling and I'm ziplining and the rope is like bending down because your brother is a big boy. And I'm struggling and they're all like completing it. And of course, I'm the last person out there like, Bradford, did you have fun? And I'm like... No. Like, why did we do this? Why did we risk, guys, I'm about to get married next week and I almost died because you wanted some thrill? No black people actually do that, and by the way. I love the stories in the gospels where there's a, there's a clear distinction, there's a clear contrast between how Jesus walks through something and how the disciples rep, like respond to something. Like I love the stories where Jesus responds in one way and the disciples responds in another way. And here we are in our text, we have a storm, a squall. The same exact storm and you have the disciples going through one experience and then you have Jesus going through it and responding to it in another way. You see the disciples who were fearful and they were, they were anxious and they were frustrated and they were confused. And then you see Jesus who was at peace and full of calm and full of courage and full of presence. There's this clear kind of contrast and distinction between how Jesus responds to something and how the disciples respond to something. And of course, if I was honest, there are Moments in my life where I can relate more to the disciples and how they respond than how Jesus like, responds. We respond in fear or respond in like an overwhelmed and we respond in chaos, but they were in the exact same storm, but yet Jesus responded one way and, and the disciples responded one way. Jesus was full of peace and he was sleeping, but then the disciples were freaking out and questioning God. Like, what, what is happening? The same exact storm, but yet there was a difference in response. You know, when I read this, this passage, I just can't, can't help but to hear the invitation to live like Jesus lives. You know, we often can, can, can connect to the disciples, but there is a invitation to actually live as Jesus lives. And here's what I believe. 
is I believe that the call for the church today is to live like Jesus lives. It's to live the way he lives, that in peace and in calm and in, and in rest and sleeping and, 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 and full of peace in the middle of a storm. Like I hear this invitation. He, he says something that's so profound. He says this. He says, why are you so afraid? Which means this, is that you have options. That, that in a storm that you have the choice to make, you have the choice to make to either live in fear in the storm or to live in peace above the storm. We have options, we have choice. And this is what he was saying. He's saying, why are you afraid? This is Jesus asking this question. Like, like why does Jesus ask questions that are so obvious? Like, he's like, why are you guys so afraid? And they're like, well, well Jesus, uh, duh, we're in the middle of a storm. Aren't you aware that we are about to die? Like, aren't you aware that we're sinking? Aren't you aware? And yet he asked this, this question, why are you so afraid? Because he knows that you have a choice to make. The choice you have to make is either to live in the storm in fear or to live above the storm in peace. And this is the difference between the disciples and Jesus, that they experienced the storm in, in fear, but Jesus lived above the storm in peace. And God is inviting you, inviting me to not just live in the storm, but live above the storm in peace. God wants you to live in peace and to walk in peace. Y'all, we are indeed in a great storm. What we thought was a storm for what would last for a few months or a few weeks have, have actually lasted longer than we think. And we are indeed in a great storm. We have storms all around us. We have storms in our marriage and storms in our finances, storms in culture, storms in society, storms in our children, storms about our children. We are indeed in a great storm. We have storms. And you and I have the choice to either live in fear in the storm or to live above the storm in peace. This word peace is not just a, a calm or a emotion. This word peace comes from the word, um, the Hebrew word shalom, which means whole and complete and in harmony and in unison, which means is that you are complete, you are whole inside of you, that what is outside of you and around you doesn't actually impact the inside of you. That you are whole and complete as if there is no storm inside you and just storms around you. Because peace is inviting you to live above the storm and not live in the storm. Can you help a brother preach today? And that's the invitation is that God calls us to live in peace, that when the world is broken and fragmented and not complete and not whole, that we on the inside of us have peace and assurance and a truth. That's what peace is. And so I want to share with you, how do we, how do we live above the storm? How do we not just live in the storm, but live above the storm. And number one is this, it's super simple, super practical, super easy, is focus on who is with you. Focus on who is with you. It is amazing to me how many of us, we go through a storm and we think that the presence of a storm means the absence of God. It's amazing how many times we walk through a pandemic or we walk through storms in our life whether storms that we create, hello somebody. <laughs> storms that just life creates or storms that the enemy said. It's amazing how we think that the presence of a storm means the absence of God. And that's what the disciples were saying. There was something in them that had amnesia. Like they just walk through life with Jesus and now suddenly they are within a storm and suddenly they think that God is absent. They think that because there's a presence of a storm, that means the absence of God, rather than look who is in their boat, not just around the storm, around them. 
When we walk through storms, sometimes we're so consumed with what's around us in the storm outside of us and not the one who is inside of our boat. Jesus is saying, do you not understand? Why are you so afraid? You have Jesus, the Prince of Peace, in your boat. Why are you fretting? Why are you fearful? Why are you overwhelmed? Why are you losing your mind because you have someone in your boat, which is Jesus? It's wild to believe that the God who made you and created you and fashioned you would just all of a sudden like abandon you. But God has not abandoned you. He is right there in your boat. He hasn't left. We just lost our awareness. Because we're so consumed with the stuff around us and the storms that we're going through and not the Jesus in our boat. But that wasn't really the problem. The problem was not who was in their boat. The problem was, can his heart be trusted? (laughs) See, the problem wasn't just who it was. It says, is he actually good to me? And we see this in the text. It says, do you even care? They were questioning his heart, not his ability. See, we believe that God is able, but do we believe that God is actually willing? Y'all are quiet up in here. Please, Online, help me today. Can you just type a little something? Because I can hear the keyboard just going. Just say, hey, man, put a black hand emoji, a little hand clap. Can, like, 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 just help me for one second. They thought that God was able but not willing. Is that he had the power as if he was some tyrant, but actually not the heart to actually care. You know, when my son was younger, um, we was at my, um, my mom's house and my mom like knits and, and, and sews and stuff. And so my mother had what was, um, a mannequin, <laughs> a mannequin, like it was freaky. Now it scared me on a good day. Okay. And so of course I was, you know, watching sports and my son was like, dad, I gotta use the bathroom. Like, 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 please help. I need to go to the bathroom. I'm like, son. I'm watching football. You are four years old. You got this. You're a man now. Go upstairs and go use the bathroom while daddy will watch his football. Now, don't judge me, dads, because you do the exact same thing. And my son comes down. He's like, no, daddy, you don't understand. I just, I just really got to go to the bathroom. I'm like, well, son, like, you, you better not pee yourself right now. So you better go upstairs right now. He's like, no, but dad, I got to go. I was like, why don't you want to go to the bathroom? He was like... It's that thing in there. It's that, it's that thing. I was like, what thing are you talking about? He's like, it's that thing in there. It's that, it's, it's that, that, that little body in there. I was like, oh, my mom's mannequin. That's not a big deal. So I'm like, no, it's a little, like, I think it's going to like move suddenly. Like we all have those moments where, where we walk, you know, through the mall. And we're like, did that thing just move? Right? Like, I, I swear it moved, right? And so my son was freaked out. And he was like, son, like, Dad, can you just like walk with me? And so, of course, I walked with him. And he had a swag to him. I was like, okay. He ain't no scared no more. He's just walking up there. He probably had to pee. That was my, you know. But he's just walking like this, right? And then he sees the mannequin, right? And then he does it. He's like, mm. Mm. And then he goes into the bathroom. And then he used the pee, right? Or he pees. And then he left. And I was like, what happened? Like, like, why are you so like, so suddenly confident? He's like, well, because you were with me. You were, you were walking with me. And then it dawned on me that it wasn't just me with him, but it's what I represented. <laughs> oh, buddy, oh, buddy, y'all ain't ready. It was not just the person of me, it was what I represented. It was my heart for my son. It was he 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 had enough trust and care that if something goes down, I know that my big daddy, who is black, big, and proud, is gonna take care of that still little mannequin thing. 
And sometimes we lose our vision. We allow the storms to remove the vision of who is in our boat. We let what we're in take away from who is with. (laughs) We allow what we're in to take away who we're with. And maybe you are in a storm today, but do you know who is with you? Maybe you're in a storm of your marriage, but do you know who's with you? Maybe you are in the hospital right now today, but do you know that who is with you is the great doctor? Maybe you are in the middle of just the greatest darkness of your life, but do you know who is with you? Is the light of God. God is not just some dogma or some principle or religion on a page. He is a person and he is with you. And that truth may be simple, but it's often we forget this simple truth is that God is bigger and that God is greater than the storms around me. And we need to not just trust who he is and that he's able, but we need to trust his heart. And it's amazing how much sin happens because we don't actually trust his heart. It's amazing how much sin and compromise happens when we don't actually trust his heart because what happens? Like when things happen, we start to escape, we start to run, and we start to try to find something with the assurance of good. We use substances and people and relationships and pornography and alcohol and all these things to escape the reality. Why? Because we're looking not just for a savior, but someone who is willing and who cares for me. Because we're looking for that, 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 that moment of, of, of pleasure that says, I'm good. <laughs> I'm okay. Life's good. And the reality is life may not be good, but you know who is good? Do you know who's good? Do you know who's good? Life may not be good to you, but do you know someone who will make all things good for the good of those who love him and trust him and for his glory? So you know that who is with you when you're in something is someone who's going to make all things good. And that's the God that was in their boat. You know, Charles Spurgeon, who is a 18th century Baptist preacher, he said this, God is too good. God is too good to be unkind and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. We must trust his heart. And that's why the Bible says that the perfect love, the perfect love cast out fear. Why? It's because when storms come, we don't need to work harder and stress and earn and achieve. We just need to draw closer. Just imagine Jesus sleeping and, and he's wondering, just sleep with me, man. Just, just chill. It's all good. Like we're chilling. God is inviting you and me to live above the storm in peace, knowing who is in our boat. See, like the... The storms may change, the storms may go and come, but what doesn't change is the God who is with me and that he is a good father, a father who is with you, a father who says that he, that he loves you, that he is with you, that he never forsakes the righteous, that he will never leave us or abandon us. And, and when we do feel that he's left us or abandoned us, because those feelings are real, we must go back to his heart. We must look back to what he's done and what he's did and look back and say, man, if God didn't uh, abandon me at my worst, God won't abandon me now. If God didn't leave me back then, God won't leave me now. And we need to trace back to his heart and believe his heart that he's good and that he's for you, that he's not just able, but he is willing to be with you and to work for you. Amen? Amen. God is not just with you. To, To not just focus on what he is, but also point two, and this is it, focus on what he said. What did he say? He said this in in, in verse 35, he says, let us go to the other side. That alone should have been peace to them. 
that Jesus, whose word just healed a person, Jesus said, let us go into the other side. That's what he said. And sometimes we can be consumed with what the word of the storm is saying and not the word of the Lord is saying. What was the word of the storm saying? He doesn't love you. What was the word of the storm saying? He's not there for you. And sometimes we can, we can hear the, the noise of what, what the word of the storm is saying and not banking on what he said. Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. And then what's hilarious, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, it says, and they went to the other side. <laughs> Thanks, gospel of Mark, for that good news. What did he say? He said, we're going to go to the other side. And sometimes the storms of life can dictate what you think about God rather than God dictating how you should think about the storm. We're so consumed with what the word of the storm is saying that sometimes that can completely overwhelm what God is saying. We don't interpret God through our storms. We interpret the storm through God. What did God say? He's saying... You will live and not die. That you will see his goodness in the land of the living. What did he say to you in the middle of a pandemic? What did God say to you? That he will encamp angels around you. What did Jesus say? What did God say? And sometimes we can be so consumed with what the storm is telling us, not what God is telling us. See, the storm will tell you that you will sink. But the word of the Lord said, you will live. The storm will tell you it's over for you. And Jesus said, we're going to get to the other side. The storm may tell you you're drowning, you're sinking. But Jesus said, matter of fact, you can actually walk on water. Oh, no way. Yes, you can, my friend. You can walk on water. See, we get so consumed with what the storm is telling us, not what God is telling us. And I want to challenge you today to not allow the storm to steal your peace. I think we need to get some holy attitude again. Some sanctified attitude of not allowing the storm to tell me to think about God. We need to get some a little bit of backbone and pull up our sleeves and put our hair in a pony. And we need to say, Storm, you do not steal my peace. You cannot be in my home. You cannot steal my peace. The pandemic, you can't steal my peace. Government, you can't steal my peace. My marriage, my kids, my kids for sure. You can't steal my peace. You have to determine that no matter what storms come your way, it is never an excuse to lose your peace. Why? Because Jesus paid a very, 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 very big price for him to give you peace. Isaiah 53 says My, his, his punishment for our peace was on him. Was on him. Jesus died so that you can have peace. Peace is your inheritance. And nothing frustrates me more with a holy, dignity, pastoral grumpiness is when people live beneath what Jesus died for. Jesus died for you to walk in peace and yet we're still listening to the word of the storm? Like how dare we? Spit on what Jesus did and what he for when and to consume the storm. That is what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to, to cast off what Jesus did. He wants you to just put it away as if it's not enough. 
And let me remind you today, let me tell you, is that what Jesus did on the cross is enough. And it's enough for no matter what storm you're walking in, his peace will sustain you. His peace will keep you. His peace will hold you. His peace will wrap you. His peace will surround you so that no matter what storms come your way, you can live above the storm in peace. It's not impossible. You just have to be aware that you have a choice. You know, sometimes we can be, be consumed with what our friends are saying and, and CTV is saying and CBC is saying and Instagram is saying and YouTube is saying and TikTok is saying and BET is saying, and MTV is saying. But what is God saying? What is the one above the storm saying? What is he saying to us? See, we can say 30 things of what the, of what the storm is saying. We can say 30 things of what the news is saying. We can say a ton of things of what the storm is saying, but what is God actually saying? What is the one above the storm saying? Of course, I'm not saying that we be naive and, and, and be stupid and, of course, over-spiritualized, but what I'm saying is, is that the storm doesn't have authority over my peace, and what's happening is, is that when you hear the voice of, of the storm, that becomes your master, when you hear the voice of the storm, that becomes your master rather, rather than the one who is, like, who is like above the storm. And my question is, which voice are you letting in to have authority over you? John 16, 33 says this. It says this, and this is what he said. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will, you will have trouble. That's great news, God, thanks. <laughs> you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You are never going to have peace when you're feasting on the wrong things. You will have peace when you're just with Jesus, the one who will give you peace. And you know what, I've... Notice that when I start to sink, that when I start to drown, that when I start to feel overwhelmed and afraid, and when I start to, to, start to slip, I've lost my sight of those, of those things. That he's with me, and that he can be trusted, and that I've forgotten what he said. Now, I know that we're human and that we're in process and we're in progress and that the Lord is, he is sanctifying us. And there's times where we lose our peace. There's times we're afraid. There's times when we're overwhelmed. There's times when we're scared. But you have to say, not for long. And then you, you be with him and that you would just be in his presence. And when you're in his presence, when, when you just allow him to love on you there, you are reminded who he is and you are reminded of his heart for you and that you are also reminded of what he said to us. And this is the invitation is that God wants you to be at peace. See, the world needs peace. The world is scared. The, scur the, the world is frightened. There's no wonder why they are reacting like they are. They're reacting in anger, in frustration, because why? They are scared. But what's sad is that Christians are just living in the storm and not living above the storm. When God has called us to live above the storm in peace, the church ought to be a pillow of peace on the bed of chaos. Is that when people walk in our rooms and that when people see you, they're like, how? Like how in the world are you at peace right now? 
When I fear for my life, when I fear for my kids' life, when I fear for my marriage, when I fear for the world, when I fear for the government, when I fear for the pandemic, and God's saying, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. What's he saying? He's saying, I am king, and if sin can conquer me, and hell can conquer me, and death can conquer me, then you sure as know that ain't no pandemic or government can take down what Jesus did. Who are you with? You're with Jesus. Oh, man. I have a friend. I'm going to close have a friend who has walked through some serious tragedy this year. He's lost uh, two siblings in one year by tragic accidents. I remember, of course, asking him, I said, bro, like, I mean, he was here like for a, a worship and he was here for CR. And I'm thinking, bro, do you understand that, that when you go through a storm, like, like people like retreat, like people overrun, people go in a hole. What has sustained? He's like, bro, I have no idea. It is so unpredictable of the peace I've found. I'm like, bro, do you know, you've walked through some serious tragedies. He's like, I know. But for some reason, I know that it's going to be okay. See, being a Christian means that we don't go through different stuff, is that we respond differently when we walk through stuff. And the people need a witness, need a witness, need a witness that everything is going to be okay. And can I stir up your, your faith today? Is that would you look at the one who is in your boat? Would you look at the one who is on your bedside? Would you look at the one who is in the hospital room with you? Would you look at the one who is with you? Would you look at the one who is with you and around you and you'll see a one who's not hurried. He's not bothered. He's not moved. He's not scared. But he's at peace and at calm. And God is inviting you through his Holy Spirit and grace to live as he lives is at peace and above the storm. The world needs peace. As I close, you know, this idea of uh, thankfulness plays a huge part in peace. Because when you're thankful, when you practice thankfulness, that's why Paul says, in everything give thanks not for everything he says in everything give thanks why because when you're thankful it lifts you up from in the storm to above the storm i dare you if you are starting to feel anxiety i dare you to just start to thank him I dare you to just start to, just in your home, say, God, thank you for my family. Thank you for your, for your goodness. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that I'm redeemed. Thank you that I'm loved. Thank you that you're awesome. Thank you that you're glorious. And when you start to thank them, you'll start to just feel some peace. You'll start to feel some joy. You'll start to feel good. Why? Because thankfulness lifts your perspective from in to above. And on this, thanks giving holiday, would you just receive the peace? Would you receive the peace that God has for you? You know, Paul says this in Philippians. He says this. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Will you live above the storm like today? Would you stand with me, please, over this room, please? If you're able to, whether here online or in the building, would you just push your hand over your heart today? You know the storms 
that are happening right now in your life. Whether it's a storm of the unknown, a storm of culture, you know the storms in your life. And would you just receive your promise today? Would you receive his inheritance? The the psalmist said, it is well with my soul. Peace like a river today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you've died so that we can receive peace. That you are, in fact, Jehovah Shalom. It's not a pretty, it's not just a pretty name. It is, in fact, who you are. You you are peace, and you came to give peace. And I pray that over your people day and over the west side and over Halifax and over the world today, God, we ask God that we need a blanket of your peace today. We need a shalom over us today. And we ask God that the church would be a light of peace, not a, not a storm stoking fire, but that we would be someone that just is at rest because we know who is the one who is above the storm. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your presence today. And God, we do declare peace be still today. We speak peace over the news and in the media, Lord, right now. We speak peace over homes today. We speak peace over marriages. We say peace be still over this pandemic in the name of Jesus. We, speak, we say peace be still over our kids today. We, sp- we pray peace be still over the school system. We pray peace be still over your church. Peace be still in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.